Mark, you are from Dublin. Where do you train? Well, I'm fortunate enough to train in my own club. Um, the club was originally called Chupsart Muay Thai, uh, and I fought for that club. And then over the years, um, I ended up leaving the job I was working at, and I've taken over that club, and um, it's called now Champion Martial Arts, and it incorporates Muay Thai, K1, and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu uh, in Dublin. Yeah, that's nice. Um, Mark, you are here to fight for the team Day of the Swatchen. What do you know about the team? Well, I suppose the first time we met, uh, where I met uh, yourself and Ralph, um, would have been in China. Uh, that would have been over a year ago. Um, we were coming over as an Irish team and we were all a part, if you remember, as part of a European team and it was Europe versus China. Um, and I always remember going in, we said in this very nice hotel, and I always remember going in. And a lot of the team, everyone was very friendly, uh, but there was also very, you know, much an air of competition in the hotel because we had the Chinese team staying with all the delegates. Um, and there was a lot of tension, no one could really relax. And I just remember uh, even some of the European fighters couldn't relax and that caused more tension, I felt. Uh, and then I remember seeing you guys and everything was relaxed and I seen your fighters. Uh, you had, I think there was two guys you had, two, maybe three guys you had over there. And I think we instantly uh, built up a rapport straight away. Um, and I remember just remember from that point on, it was, and it, as always, it was around food, fighters obsessing about food. So when it came to lunchtime, um, I remember just sitting down with you guys and I suppose at the very start and still it's a, it's a very positive it was a very positive introduction and you know it's obviously stayed strong this long because you know a year and a half nearly two years later I'm over here representing Day of Destruction and I couldn't be happier you know I couldn't be happier to to, to put on the top and, and, and do the best I can and represent Day of Destruction as best as I can. So it seems that you feel in good hands yeah? Yeah 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 like as I said, even over there, chatting to Ralph and, and chatting to the fighters, you can tell a lot by chatting to the fighters. Um, you know, it's not, we're not in a sport where you're going to become millionaires and honesty is probably the only real currency a fighter has and a coach has. So you're very quick to be told. People will tell you about coaches and teams and fighters and what they think. Not necessarily it's always true, but, uh, you know, I've only heard good things. I've only seen good things. And, and from talking to Ralph, mostly long distance before I've actually came over here, uh, we just hit it off. We, we, you know, we clicked. And that's, that's quite difficult to do, uh, even in your own country, uh, with teammates and, and coaches at home. So, uh, you know, and it's even more difficult when there's a, a couple of countries in between. So, you know, I'm lucky and I'm lucky to get this opportunity to represent Day of Destruction. And, you know, I just hope that uh, I can display the best of what I can do. And guys, uh, have you seen this crazy fight uh, of Mark against uh, John Wayne Parr in Cage Muay Thai? This was in 2015, uh, in the cage with the small gloves. Uh, would you say this was the sports peak? Well, for me, uh, John Wayne Parr, like some of the other guys I fought before, um, I looked up to them actually when I came into the sport, maybe eight, nine years ago when, when I turned professional in Thai boxing and K1. Um, these guys were at their peak. These guys, John Wayne Parr, 10 times world champion. Um, and he's a legend. He's a legend uh, among European fighters, but he's also a legend in Thailand. So when I was given the opportunity to jump into the cage, I, I couldn't say no. I couldn't say no. Even when the rules changed, well, they didn't change. I knew exactly what it was. It was going to be caged Muay Thai. And I was aware that it's, very, it's a very different sport. It's, it's, it's polar opposite. You might as well be you know, comparing basketball to soccer you know they're two very different sports two strategies two different training camps uh, and I was going in against a 10 time world champion and the founder of cage Muay Thai uh, as a main event but you know uh, with the minute I got over there I was picked up by um, his partner and his wife I met his kids I went from the airport straight to his family house and I met John Wimpar there so you could see the level of professionalism and even then it showed me like that was two years ago that uh, no matter how successful or how good you get or how well you're respected or world renowned uh, there's still great guys out there that are humble that have won huge accolades now in saying that was I nervous about getting into uh, the cage with small gloves absolutely you know any, any, any high performance fighter or world champion that says that he doesn't get nervous before a match is lying it's the ability to manage uh, fears and manage expectations so for me that was one of the peaks uh, of my career uh, and, and to learn that you know sometimes you don't have to win for it to be a peak or for, for you to get your hand raised for it to be a win um, you don't feel that way straight afterwards it takes a little bit of uh, looking back but yeah that was definitely a peak getting in with John Wayne Parr it was fantastic 
Yes, you, Mark, you're a born fighter, I would, I would say. So uh, you're in the fighting business since law, such a long time. Uh, today you have an experience of nearly 50 fights. Um, how can we? Um, uh, how would you explain your preparation for a, for for a fight? Do you yeah. train until the bitter end? Yeah, yeah, I would, I would. I'm a big advocate of sports science and efficiency of training and I think there is golden rules when it comes to strength and conditioning and fitness uh, and but within the structure and the framework of these uh, rules set out by sports science and exercise physiologists there's rooms to maneuver and that's what I do so I set a template out of six weeks to eight weeks of a training camp um, and I taper so basically I start off training volume increases as I go on and then depending on the volume of that camp and how hard the training is I start to taper off one to two weeks afterwards um, but for me the definition of taper isn't just to stop training the week or two before it's actually to reduce three sessions a day to one a day and maintain intensity so intensity is never sacrificed the body is always firing at the same pace and the same strength as it always has uh, in the camp so like After this interview, we're going to Ralph's gym and we're going to train, and I'm looking forward to it. So training never stops. And training never stops. Also, not in the CM store. So, uh, Mark, imagine you are you are really old. You are maybe a grandfather. Um, what would you tell uh, your little child or whatever uh, about your sportive career? Are there special moments? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you know I might define them a little bit differently. You know, the older I get. Um, you already have me thinking of grandchildren. I'm trying to get past children first. I'm already on grandchildren. <laughs> um, but if I was to talk to a grandchild, um, I, you know, 20, 30 years down the road, for me right now, I know that, you know, winning uh, my national belts, becoming the national Muay Thai champion, um, becoming the Anglo-Irish champion in Muay Thai, which means the British champion fights the Irish champion and the winner becomes the Anglo champion. So, uh, you know, I've racked up, you know, six professional belts, um, and each of them, I have gone through a very difficult training camp, uh, some of which, you know, I've overcome a lot of a lot of adversity um, that would have been personal to me to get through. And, you know, it, it's, I was, you know, I came out the right side, I got the win, I got the belt, but I also got a huge life lesson that I feel now, four, five, six, seven years later, that I'm only starting to reap the benefits from. Um, so I suppose each of my titles. But then, you know, I think the older... I'm going to get, I think it's going to be about not just the belts and the wins, but the relationships and the people I meet along the way. So, you know, for example, meeting um, yourself and Ralph in China, you know, who would have thought that that would have led to me coming over to, to Hamburg nearly two years later, you know, so little things like that, I think I start to maybe appreciate more the older I get. Mark, um, we are a little bit interested, and you, uh, as a as a guy, yeah. besides your life uh, of, a, of, a, of a sportsman. So, what is important for you in your life? What's important? Okay, that's a tough question. Um, I suppose training is obviously important, but I suppose the deeper, uh, I suppose the deeper answer to that is is to do what I suppose what you love to do, your passion, and to enjoy it. Uh, for me at the moment, it's running my club, the business of running my club and competing. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to be in the position to uh, coach and run a club and, and run a good business, as well as still being at the peak of my career. Uh, and that itself has challenges, and it's them challenges that sometimes keep me up at night. But it's also the same reason why I get up early in the morning and I go running at four or five in the morning. Uh, so I suppose it's to be happy and to create a balance. Um, and if I can't create a balance in anything in my life, something's got to go or I've got to add something in. So unless I'm smiling most days, there's a problem. Mark, where do you see yourself in maybe 30 years? 30 years, hopefully uh, more in the business end. Hopefully more in the business end and, and, and hopefully in, in sports. I'm, I'm, I'd like to be running a bigger club, uh, maybe promoting, co-promoting. Um, and maybe some side businesses too that, that maybe have, aren't linked to, to fighting or, or sport. Um, I'd be an advocate of, you know, I'd, before I st set up the club, I was looking at different franchises, different businesses, different areas. But when you're starting up a new business, uh, a club, you have to put all your time in. You can't, you can't uh, take too much time away. And that's the only reason why I can kind of still compete and coach at the same time because they're, they're married together. The two things are kind of married together. So in 30 years, uh, 
hopefully successful in business. Uh, I will take for granted that that's going to be in sport and Muay Thai and K1. Uh, and, and yeah, and, and just be happy in doing what I'm doing. I'm possibly retired. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, uh, well, Muay Thai is uh, very tough, uh, very hard. So when you are old, what kind of sport you could imagine you may do then? Well, I've actually started one sport um, three years ago, four years ago maybe. Um, started off as, not a joke, but maybe lightheartedly I started it off and I started to do it a little bit more and more and took it a little bit more serious. Uh, and that is, I took up uh, ballroom dancing. So I think something like, maybe something like that. I would think, you you know, it's classy, it's enjoyable, it's keeping you fit and it's, I think it's, It's a timeless sport with a lot of history and, 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 and something like that I can see myself doing. But I could also see myself hitting pads when I'm 60, 70 years of age. Just not as hard as I'm going to hit them now today. Uh, but I'd like to mix, you know, something like that. The, the, the softer side to a sport, um, but just being active. So I'd imagine possibly ballroom dancing. Yes, what I heard is uh, when you are a good boxer, you're all also a good dancer. Yeah, I can't disagree with that. Yeah, I agree, I agree with that. Although some people might might disagree with me but it's you know what I've, I've used that sport and, I, and i've used doing some ballroom classes as a bit of a, a catharsis to, to take a break away from training sometimes so sometimes when training gets a bit tough or you might get injured in some camps or a bit run down uh, you need an outlet and you need to kind of blow off some steam so you know i think a lot of fighters downfalls is they blow off steam in different ways they might drink or they might put on weight or they might eat too much food uh, i think the positive way is to do something that you know Especially with ballroom, you can choose what level, you know, and how, what intensity to go at. And for me, it was a, a bit of an escape and something to enjoy. And I found that doing something like that, that's positive and still active, realigns me and brings me back to center. And I find, you know, I'm competing in sport combatively um, for 24 years. I'm fighting 24 years and no injuries. All small injuries, swells and sprains, but they heal. So I'm very fortunate. But I think a lot of that's down to my mindset and how I see problems and how I get over, um, I suppose, big problems and how I foresee solving the problem. Um, so, yeah, it's um, for me, it's, I suppose it's about having a contingency uh, when you reach that point in training where you can't, want, you don't want to train or you can't train and all the best fighters get it. Well, we wish you a good time here in Germany. Enjoy it. Thank you. So, we are Day of Destruction TV today with Mark Kesseli from Ireland. Stay tuned with us. Ooh.